the wrong no contact. No contact. This is what anybody who has been a victim of our kind must achieve. Whether that status of victim stems from being a friend to a narcissist when you are taken for granted, used when the narcissist needs a lift or someone to moan to, or whether it is the beaten down and trampled intimate partner primary source who is the wife, boyfriend or partner and has endured and suffered extensive abuse. No contact is the antidote. Building that robust and effective wall of no contact can be difficult. This is primarily because of two things. First of all, most people don't actually know how to impose no contact properly because of the amount of rubbish that is written about narcissism or spoken about it. And secondly, the enemy within wants to pull down your walls, wants to leave the gate open and wants you building foundations on quicksand, i.e. emotional thinking. It doesn't want you going no contact. No contact is time consuming. It requires rigour and perseverance. And not only are you trying to repel the advances of the narcissist, who is trying to breach your no-contact regime, you also have to fight against yourself and your emotional thinking, which is repeatedly looking to make you breach no-contact as well. Indeed, it is often your emotional thinking which proves to be the harder enemy to conquer, and it is not a one-off battle. Your emotional thinking, because of who you are, and the emotional infection that your engagement with the narcissist has caused means that this is an ongoing battle which requires your repeated vigilance. Through the application of understanding and building your logic defences, the task does become easier, but it is not one which goes away. Like any wall that has been built, it must be checked, it must be maintained, it must be patrolled. Otherwise, holes and breaches occur, and the narcissist will impact on you once again. Time and time again, I see people who think they have put in place no contact, and they haven't. Sometimes, it almost beggars belief that the victim thinks that they have established no contact. It's obvious they haven't. In other instances, you might be forgiven for thinking that you have implemented no contact because of a lack of access to my information, but in actual fact you haven't. There are many instances where people think they have instigated no contact and all they have done is embark on the wrong no contact. To assist you, I am going to list a few of the many ways in which you may well be getting no contact wrong and the risks that come with implementing the wrong no contact. Number one, looking at social media. Just because the narcissist does not explicitly know that you have looked at his or her social media doesn't mean this is no contact. Indeed, we often rely on you doing so, and that is why, in certain instances, you are not actually blocked from looking at our Facebook account, Twitter feed, Instagram, and so forth. We actually want you to look at it. We may not be interested in interacting with you directly because we are focused elsewhere, but this doesn't mean that we don't want you occasionally looking and being reminded of how wonderful our life is in comparison to what you have been left with. Just because you are not interacting directly with us, just because you are not commenting and we are not replying, just because you are not adding likes, this is not no contact. If you are looking at our social media, you will see things that you don't like. You will see relationship bulletins about your replacement reminders of the golden period, and even sometimes direct attacks against you. This will result in a risk that you will be upset, hurt, angry. The maintenance and increase of your emotional thinking, because you are thinking about us and you are looking at something in relation to us. A surge of emotional thinking which may then cause you to interact further with us, for instance, attacking us for our barbed comments towards you, or to contact a friend and talk about what you've seen on our social media stopping you from moving forward. Many times people consult with me and they'll say, HG, he's posted some pictures of him and the new woman on social media. What does it mean? And I respond with, you're asking me the wrong question. And the person says, what do you mean? And I say, you should be asking yourself this. 
I know that I'm dealing with a narcissist. Why on earth am I looking at the narcissist's social media when I should be in no contact? There's invariably a pause. I didn't realise that that was part of no contact, is sometimes the answer. Or, yes, you're right. But, could you still tell me? And of course it is brushed to one side because of the surge of emotional thinking and the desire to understand why those photographs are there. Invariably, many of the problems that occasion with your social, with your no contact regimes are actually caused because you've breached it to begin with. If you've got those thoughts as to why has the narcissist posted that on social media, if you hadn't looked, you wouldn't have to ask the question. If you're wondering why did he write this in the email, of course if you'd ensured that the email couldn't reach you, or that you, even if the email got through you didn't read it, you wouldn't then have all of those questions going through your mind as to what was meant to be in the content of the email. And therefore this is why no contact has to be so robust and rigid to prevent, in effect, you scoring your own goals and causing you to continue to think about the narcissist or act upon something the narcissist has done by focusing on something that you ought not to have known about. Social media falls heavily into this category. You don't need to know what the narcissist is doing. Not blocking our number. You may think that it will be the first thing that you will do when you commence no contact. You block our number from your telephone and mobile phones that we cannot call or text you from the relevant number. Of course, we invariably get around this, if so motivated to do so, by using a different device. Therefore, that is why you are much better served by changing your telephone numbers. But if you don't change the number, then you, at least as a bare minimum, ought to block the new number of ours, which appears and keeps doing so, like a matador, dodging the onrushing bull each time to avoid harm. Nevertheless, the number of occasions I see people who claim they're in no contact, but they've not blocked our number, is higher than you might think. HG, I'm in no contact, but he keeps texting me. How do I make it stop? Here's the news. You're not in no contact. These people think that if they, as victim, don't contact us, then that is no contact. No it is not. Of course, those people who don't block the number are giving in to their emotional thinking because they are being led to want the narcissist to contact them. If you don't block our number, you are not in no contact. One of the easiest hoovers for a narcissist to perform is to text you. It uses next to no effort and brings with a reduced consequence of wounding, say compared to ringing you on the telephone or seeing you in person, and allows us to control you and draw fuel. If you do not block our number, you are lowering the hoover bar to such a low level that hoovers are more or less inevitable. The emotional thinking of victim tells them things such as It's over. There was a final discard. He'll never contact me anyway. If she does text me, I won't reply. And that will wound her. So actually I'm winning. There might be an emergency and therefore I cannot block him. Utter rubbish. First of all, there's no such thing as a final disengagement or final discard. We will contact you, subject to the Hoover triggers being activated and the Hoover execution criteria being met. If you don't block us, this is going to happen. You will be Hoovered. If you allow a text through, you are maintaining interaction with the narcissist and you will suffer a surge in emotional thinking, which may very well result in you then responding. And before you know it, you are being subjected to our control, you are providing us with fuel and you're increasing your emotional thinking even further and you could even be drawn back into the formal relationship. Months later, you'll ask, how the hell did that happen? Listen to Slice, Slice and Slice again for an excellent example of how that comes about. And don't think that it won't happen to you. There is a risk that it will. Every text which arrives adds more and more to your emotional thinking until such time that you lose insight and you no longer resist. Oh, I hear your protestations that you can resist, but I have witnessed repeatedly such resolve melt away. If you are playing Russian roulette and you pull the trigger once and don't blow your brains out, you've survived. Pick the gun up again and again and again, you will eventually kill yourself. Why on earth are you keep picking up the revolver? You don't need to, so don't. 
This is the similar effect of repeatedly engaging with us by allowing those texts through. You will succumb. So what if there is an emergency? I recognize that you are kind, decent and honest, but we are no longer your concern in that respect. You need to remind yourself that you have no obligation towards us. Of course, our perspective will make us tell you differently, and therefore, for instance, that false suicide power play hoover is not something you have to deal with. If you co-parent, then utilize the very useful assistance package, How to Co-Parent with a Narcissist, which will get around this problem. When the narcissist realizes that you are not responding, you will see how the Hoover attempts start to diminish. Number three, keeping our telephone number. You may say that you will not use it and therefore think that this is no contact. But once again, this is not no contact. With our number sat in your phone, even if you have changed the description to arsehole number one, shit for brains or narcopath, you are creating problems. You see the name and number, and you are then reminding yourself of us, and therefore this is a breach of no contact, its ever-presence. You're leaving open a gateway. There will be an occasion when your emotional thinking surges and causes you to try to contact us. If our number is there, you will use it and message us or ring us. If there is no number, you can't call us. Now, of course, you might, f might go and look it up in some way, but that places another barrier and you might just have sufficient time for a reduction in your emotional thinking so you don't act on it. Think of it this way. If you're a drug addict and you're addicted to cocaine, for example, and you keep cocaine in your house and you know the number of the dealer and you hang out with people that regularly take it, you're going to keep on taking it. But if you delete the number of the dealer, you don't have any in your house and you stop hanging around with the people that habitually take it, you increase your chances of staying away from it. Do not come up with the nonsense of, I've memorized the number, so I'll remember it anyway, so what difference does it make if I keep the number in my phone? Bollocks. Your memory is fallible, and over time, if you haven't used our number, you will eventually forget it altogether, or at least get some numbers mixed up. If it's still in your directory, you'll ring it. Delete that number, do it, and do it now. Number four, talking to friends and family about us. You may think that because you are not engaging with us directly, then this must mean no contact is in place. It's not in place if you continue to talk about us to your friends and your family. This is causing you to engage with us, albeit indirectly. All this does is result in you continuing to think about us with a consequential impact on your emotions. You get angry, you get upset, you get frustrated. The continued feeding of your emotional thinking, which you should be purging, not feeding, and it causes your emotional thinking to surge with the risk that this may control you once again and taking you into a further arena of interaction, causing you to contact us or succumbing to a direct hoover with all that follows from that. It is of course inevitable that in the immediate aftermath you will discuss the situation with your family and friends, especially when you don't understand what you're dealing with. That is understandable and you get a pass to do it for a short period of time, but after that you must stop. Once you realize that you're dealing with a narcissist, there's no need to have any more discussions. If you're not sure whether the person is, use the narc detector. Don't discuss it with your family and friends. They invariably have no idea whether the person is or not. They are not experts. Indeed, they may actually be reveling in joining in the narc bashing sessions, which aren't helping you at all. All you're doing is keeping the interaction with the narcissist alive. Alternatively, they are probably sick of hearing you going on and on about him or her and want you to shut up, but tolerate it out of sense of loyalty. And they'd be rather pleased when you stop talking about them. If you're unsure about who the individual is, consult with me and I'll tell you one way or the other and with reasons. Once you know, you go. No more debating it with your best friend. No more mulling it over with your fuck mole mates after the game in the pub. No more ifs and buts discussions with your parents. This person is a narcissist, and you are not to dedicate any more time to discussing this person. If you have to discuss an arrangement concerning the narcissist because they are collecting the children from your parents, then that is allowable, but keep it to that. You do not need to tell the people, again, what the narcissist did or said. All you're doing is repeating this person is a narcissist. You already know this. They already know this. So why do you keep going on about it? Of course, you think that you're trying to get some answers, but notice that you're not. And all you're doing is being conned by your emotional thinking. Don't talk about us. 
Explain to your friends that you don't want the narcissist spoken about to you. And if they try to do so, politely explain again that this person is off limits, means nothing to you anymore, and therefore there is no need to talk about them. Number five, watching what we are doing. You may make the intelligence agencies proud of your covert observations of us as you watch where we go, who we are with, and what we are doing. You really don't need to do this. Again, once you know what we are, get out and stay out. Yes, I understand it's so tempting to know what we are up to. Are we seeing someone else? What does he or she look like? Why are we going to these places? But all you're doing is keeping the engagement with us alive, getting yourself upset, angry, frustrated, annoyed, and feeding your emotional thinking, and possibly, if you're spotted, prompting some kind of malign hoover from us. All you're doing is maintaining a link with us. Your emotional thinking, of course, will tell you that it is permissible to engage in this behaviour because you are not contacting us directly. You are merely observing. These are examples of your emotional thinking conning you into thinking this stalking and observation is a good idea. You are gathering evidence to tell other people what we are doing to confirm what you have told them previously. You don't need to. You know what we are. That's all you need. You don't have to persuade other people. You are gathering evidence for a court case. You don't have to do this. Hire somebody to do this. Or if you can't afford to do that, have a friend or family member do it. Also, question, do you really need this evidence? You want to know who the narcissist is seeing so you can warn this person about, her, about us. Part of your decent nature, but unnecessary. You owe the new person, the new victim, no such obligation to warn them. And in any event, it is unlikely that you will be believed because of the smearing that will be done against you. You just need to know for your own peace of mind, for closure. Utter nonsense. You don't need to know at all. You already know what you're dealing with. Recognise these slights of mind by your emotional thinking and act on them. If you keep watching us, all you're doing is creating harmful emotions that impact on you, keeping the emotional thinking alive and growing, causing your emotional thinking to surge so that you might enter a further arena of interaction, being spotted by us and suffering a hoover, benign or malign, being spotted by us and being on the end of a restraining order, smearing or similar harassment. These are just five examples of the wrong no contact. There are many more. Be alert for them, recognize them and understand why you are not implementing no contact. Stop letting your emotional thinking con you. Once you know, you go. Get out. Stay out. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.